Call the meeting to order. Call the governor roll call. Sure. Uh, Allison Wolf here. Tom Duster here. Scott Mullick here. Roger Lang here. Kim Hewson here. Wes Lowry here. Kevin Bowden here. Jason Elkins here. Cole Bartlett here. Bob Allen is not here yet. Josh Sherman is not either. Heather McIntyre is here, and Councilman Bill Martin is not here yet. Chair, you do have a call. Um, just for everybody's information, in case you didn't know, City Council is going to choose the board member tomorrow. Our vacancy. Will that oh, really? decision be made tomorrow night? Oh, okay. We'll find out then. Okay. Uh, approval of previous month's meetings, uh, minutes. Any questions or comments on last month's minutes? A motion to approve. Move to amend. Any second? Scott? I don't think Thomas can do it. Oh. <laughs> so, sorry. I just I heard the silence, so I thought maybe. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, all in favor? Justify saying yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay. Tim, are you doing the water status or I could do that? Um this morning, the flow at uh, St. Mary at uh, Lyons was uh, 16 and a half CFS uh, with a historical average of functionally the same at 16 CFS. Uh, the call on St. Mary uh, this morning changed to highway number two uh, with an admin number of 11,642 and a priority date of November of 15th, 1881. Uh, the call on the main stem of the South Park River is Riverside Reservoir. Ed number, Ed number 21,698, and a priority date of uh, May 29th, 1989. Um, Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock is at an elevation of 6397, or approximately 15,578 feet, which is down approximately 16 acre feet from full. Union Reservoir is at an elevation of 25.7 feet, or 11,000 Zero seven or uh, eleven thousand acre feet, which is now approximately six seventeen hundred acre feet. And the St. Green Basin storage at December first was sixty nine percent. Any questions? All right. Thanks, Tim. Uh, public and value return. Yeah. Okay. We have Leo with us. I'm training him to um, take my place in case of absence or anything like that. So he'll be filling in for us when I'm gone. Well, you're going a lot, are you? I'm not planning to be, but <laughs> I will be missing the January meeting. Oh, absolutely. Any uh, agenda revisions? We do. Um, just a minute. We inadvertently didn't get the memo item in for cash and lieu, so I apologize for that, but we can pass that out and I'll discuss that when we get the memo item. Okay, on the development activity, uh, want some makers? Yeah, so I'll just go over that briefly with water board. <clears throat> Westview Acres annexation is a 7.6 acre parcel. There are no historic water rights pertinent to that annexation. Included in that annexation is a 1.36 acre uh, right of way in airport. So uh, Westview Acres annexation is in compliance with the water requirement policy of title annexation. It will be on the final plat upon the satisfaction of the 18.75 acre full rights. Um, just for a quick little background, the uh, What's being proposed on this side is approximately 22 uh, lots. There's currently two lots, um, so we're adding 20 uh, single family homes along with the remainder of the existing two lots. So that's all I have. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a whole lot of vacancies. Well, 
watch out that way, I wouldn't think so. You can take a family watch. That's what's being proposed. They, they put a concept plan in the annexation and that'll be fleshed out with that. Any questions from anybody concerning this? Is there, is there already any residents? There are. There's two. There's That's two where you see those little three little okay. lines that go up because there'll be two existing residents. Okay. That makes sense. And they're going to they're going to be It'll, the, the plan is right now, there's two lots, existing lots that stay, okay. and then around the perimeter will be an additional family lot. That's pretty dense. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's not as dense as some areas. I mean, it'll be, but it's commensurate with probably the surrounding area. Is it, okay. Okay. Some of second. All right, second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. And she moves. So, yeah, I'll take that, Roger. Um, <clears throat> so, just uh, this is going to look very similar to what you saw in the last quarter. Uh, that being that, uh, as a reminder, Cash and Lou um, is presently at $48,500 per acre foot, and that was based upon uh, Council's recommendation to set that based on the entire cost of providing a full acre foot of water uh, to the city portfolio, uh, more specifically as it relates to the Windy Gap project, the being the principal project. Um, we had thought that there might be some more uh, financial information coming in from the Northern staff that's managing the project. Um, however, at this time, uh, we're still waiting on that. That kind of ties to the Colorado River Con Connectivity Channel project that was going around. We've talked about that a little bit in the past. Um, the, um, we're using, uh, the project is using um, some of its reserves to cover project changes and cost increases. Um, money is still in there in those reserves to cover that, but it's likely that next year they'll be coming to the participants um, to cover those additional costs. It's, it's just kind of expected. And so as soon as we get any additional requests for, for money for this project, um, then we'll bring that to Water Board and then those numbers can be revised. But as of right now, it's still at that sum total of 48.5. So therefore, um, <clears throat> staff is still recommending no further changes to the to the current cash and at this time. Well, given that information, do you have any sense of which direction those numbers might go? They would change, or we do not know until we get there. The direction, or they're going to be asking for money, so they're probably going to love. That would be the direction. I think what you're asking is maybe how much. But the well, I no, I, first I want to know, you know, if you sense that it would change upward. I, I believe it's going it's to change upward, yes. And I don't know how much. Um, usually a large project, it's standard to have a 10% contingency. I think in this case, even before the litigation, as you guys may recall, there was, it may have even went up to close to 20%. But there's... You know, a large project like this, a significant part of it is probably uh, fuel costs. And a project that takes this long, fuel costs change. We all understand that. And so there'll be a lot of different details that'll come out. But, um, so I, don't, I can't say exactly how much, but um, I think it's fair to, that we all should be anticipating another uh, request for keep those reserves in place so that they don't have to stop work. And, and the timing of this would be, what, sometime first quarter, or would it go beyond that? I don't know, I think, what do you think, Ed? Yeah. You know, we might have it for the March setting, but more than likely the June setting. We kind of know what some of the numbers are, and I'll cover that in an update on the Windy Gap, but okay. um, it'll, it'll, the actual, you know, we need any additional 
delay for probably a year because it's project reserve and project cash is there. So it will happen next year, not contemplated, it will happen next year. So three is usually when you plan a project, but we will know the numbers this spring. Any questions for Matt? Tom? Yeah, I, I do have a question. So g given that we've just kind of recently moved to a new cash and lieu value, I guess, um, and that, that we've adopted kind of a new approach in, in calculating the cash and lieu, um, I don't think we've had any discussion uh, yet, um, but I think it may be worth discussing the extent to which any of these kind of in incremental increases in project costs get passed along to this concept that we, you know, that, that is cash in lieu, right? So, so in other words, is every dollar amount that goes up that, that we have to pay out in order to kind of like cover some kind of contingency or something on the connectivity channel or some kind of cost increase on it to the uh, hollow or something? How, how do how do that how do we anticipate that those things will translate into increases in the cash and lieu payments or, or or values or whatever? So, so if I could just add how we did it in our last kind of reassessment of it, we used when we got Fermi project the two hall construction as the benchmark for that. Um, as time goes on, we'll continue to report all the different variables we've looked at. But if you use, if we continue to use the Windy Gap Fermi project, if that cost goes up, then incrementally instead of 48.5, that project will be 49 or 50 or 51. And then I think Water Board can look at that and say, either we're, we're, we're good with what we have now, or we want to use that new number. And that'll really be up to the board when we get any new numbers. Right now, we don't have it. You know, there hasn't been a request, but it, it's going to be a while before that. And then that'll probably be the biggest thing is when, when do we pull that trigger? <laughs> when we actually spend the money or when we know how much it is. And so, um, but yeah, in my mind, I, I would anticipate if we have a new number for the Windy Gap Fermi project, that seems like a reasonable metric to use to set cash and move. So if it goes up a little bit, I could see cash and move going up a little bit. Similar to how we've always done it, you know, whatever metric we when we use CBT, if a CBT went up, cash and move went up or down, many times they went down. But it tracked it. And I would propose we'd probably track it with this project too. Yeah, I guess I guess my my point is that it, that it was kind of stable for so I mean not not necessarily stable, but certainly much much lower than it is today um, for a very long time or for for some period of time at least. We've just made this kind of recent update to the cash and lieu kind of approach and whether or not we as, as water board would want to kind of like recommend that any costs future incremental costs in these projects get passed on immediately or directly whether that's the kind of like future kind of approach that we want to take is is small incremental changes over time with each one of these kind of new updates in the cost of the projects or whether we would want to kind of like, you know, roll those out kind of on, a, on some type of, you know, different type of basis, I guess. So, and I don't know that I know the answer to that. I'm just kind of putting the, the thought out there, I guess, for eventual discussion. So. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, real quick question kind of related to what Tom just before, but then it's my understanding this will impact the When is the cash in lieu payment to kind of get triggered? Mm -hmm. So cash in lieu payments are received more frequently as related to platting. Okay. Um, 
the raw water requirement policy affords a developer, once it has been annexed, to satisfy all the remaining deficit for that annexation, but typically they'll wait until they have like a subset of that remaining and they plat in. Otherwise, the cost is much greater. So you can envision if you had a hundred acres of annexed, you might plat four 25 acre pieces over four years and only do your cash in lieu associated with each one of those. But depending on the owner of the developer's perspective, they may choose to satisfy all 100 acres, whatever's left with that, right after annexation, so that, if you will, they, they've satisfied their, their not less than three acre foot per acre requirement. But and we've had that occasionally, but it's usually been when the historic water rights have nearly satisfied all the deficits, because it's it just makes more, I'll call it marketing sense to say there are no further raw water deficits due, instead of saying we've got a small little fraction, but it, each annexation is, is unique for sure. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. So if I understand you correctly, we've got kind of two different categories of property within the annexations that the charter is tracking. One of the things that can get to be annexed and two of the things that have been annexed that have yet to be plowed. Mm -hmm. Do we have a sense of how much earlier that is? And if so, how much we would be looking at for current rates if we went from 35? Or if we do a concept of saying how much we're going to plow further? So we want to maybe even take a high goal scenario and a low goal scenario and just kind of bring that out a little bit in terms of the actual order of magnitude of how long it's going to be plowed right so far. Yeah, so we, we do have a, a gross idea. So we based upon the current Longmont planning area, we know how much area within that planning area has not yet been annexed. Okay. And then we also have a, a pretty good idea of what the historic water rights are associated with that. Mm -hmm. So then removing that from the equation leaves the remaining amount. But each, again, each property is unique. So you can look at it in a, on a gross scale, but probably a little bit of emphasis added. The policy is an area-based policy and not a use-based policy. So I know we talk a lot about, you know, high density versus low density or whatever. And we, there's, and then I also remind the board that there is a piece in the existing raw water requirement policy so that if any parcel shows to use greater than three acre feet per acre, then they have to bring that additional water to the table to satisfy that additional. Amount. So, um, I don't have the, that number in front of me to say how much less the historic water right is, is there. I think we could probably get a, a general, I could probably give you a general sense maybe next month of what magnitude we're talking about. Okay. But again, also got to keep in mind that the policy allows them to bring acceptable non historic water rights. Right. So, it may or may not be cash and lieu that we receive to satisfy that deficit. Yeah, that's a good I'd be curious about that figure just to kind of get a sense of. We, we have all of that in, in a GIS format as well. It's kind of really hard to not look at it in the GIS format. We'd be happy to bring that up, not right now, but <laughs> at a, a future meeting, we'd be happy to bring that up. And, and it, sometimes it helps me to see where it is and how much it gives me a sense of compared to everything visually you can see. So if you're interested, we'll be happy to bring yeah, I post it. Yeah. That thing, and then we all yeah. get it. We will do that. Okay, great. Okay. Um, should we take action to approve this? Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? If they're not changing the bill, we're not going to need action. We need action. All right. All right. Very good. Next, 9A uh, is Bob. Where is I'm here. Oh, yeah. nice. We're nice. down here, nice. stuck in, in the hiding place. I think I'm supposed to talk about our new org, org structure, new organization, Longmont. Yeah, that's the that's the item on the agenda here. I was I was kind of realizing that I was digging, drilling down into this water group structure and not 
thinking about the whole city structure that might might be put to review. Um, so I, I don't know how many know exactly how the city is organized, but over the last few years, certainly since Harold has been here, we've moved to this assistant city manager model. And each of the, what do we have, three city assistant city managers manage a, I'll, I'll call it kind of a portfolio of city services. And um, so Joni Marsh still has the, the planning, development, redevelopment, code. Um, I, I'm not even going to go through it all because I won't pull it out of my head really quickly, but um, she's kind of focused around that area, which is an obvious, all the things with affinities, the planning. And then Sandy Cedar has a group that's called Shared Services, which is all the cities, um, I was careful to use this term, there, I always use the term enterprise level services, but not like enterprise funds. Enterprise level being legal, finance, you know, um, human resources, things of that nature. And um, in particular, finance are centered in that group. And then Dave Hornbacher now has the portfolio of public works and utilities. So within that group, and I think that's the slide we have up here, is um, Dave Hornbacher's group, um, under which resides this water and waste department. You can see on the far left a, um, a public works group and then uh, the electric group. And then we've got some things off to the side, but the three major uh, focus areas of the utilities, um, the electric utility, and the public works transportation group. So within, within this group, um, the staff predominantly in here today are within this water and waste services group. And the purpose of this organization was, um, well, a few things, everything of course suddenly has different reasons why, why we bring in change. But um, one, of the, one of the big things we had for a long time was a very strong leader in our organization who recently retired. And in doing that, um, that, that leader, um, Dale Rademacher, that most of you know, had been here a long time and had um, really good knowledge about a lot of things, and even to a pretty deep level. And so the organization that was structured under him um, was one that um, was really played to his strengths and his knowledge and his ability to direct that group within what I would call a matrix organization structure rather than vertical integration of the utilities and other services we have. It was a hybrid to be sure. I mean, the electric utility was vertically integrated. However, the water, sewer, storm, and even the transportation utility was kind of in a matrix form where you had engineering in this slice, you had operations in this slice, you had the financial services in this slice, and when he retired, there was a consideration for how to maybe change that organization to play the strengths of those who remained and that could lead in certain areas. And that's kind of what we have here then is we've gone back to somewhat of a vertical integration of the water, sewer, the wet utilities, rather than, than them being split into a bunch of different departments. They're now sitting predominantly in one department transportation and public works on the far left, kind of more vertically integrated, more traditional style uh, public works group. You can cut the pie any way you want to and still be successful. This is the way we've cut it, working with Errol to, I think, deliver the services in the best possible way and kind of, kind of restore a little bit of a focus in particular on these wet utilities. Um, we had so much of the decision making split up among so many different people that it was becoming almost too complex. Um, there's a little bit of the, the who's on first or who's making this decision versus that decision. So a little bit of this was to actually refocus that um, so that we have these groups that really have common a common portfolio of services within them. And it plays a little bit more to the strengths of those of us who are uh, providing leadership in the organization. So that's, um, what do we have? Yeah, that, this yeah, this shows 
uh, just this group. And you know, at, at this point, it's really kind of a, an accumulation of the things that were in these other groups when it was a matrix organization. So we've got a treatment operations group, uh, pressure and gravity systems operations that are in a kind of a big operations group which is somewhat similar to what we had. Engineering now is focused just on water and wastewater in that area. And then you have um, the um, regulatory services, environmental services in the lab, and then water resources. So those are really remnants of a past organization. They fit in here pretty well. Um, we'll, we'll probably continue to do a little tweaking to optimize this. The other thing that's in this group is the, um, the sanitation, the waste, solid waste services. And that, that group is technically a utility. It certainly is different than everything else. Um, I think it continued in this group um, in part because I led it for quite some time and it kind of followed me in. Um, but who knows what the future of that might be. It, it, could be, um, it could be something different and it certainly has affinities with other things in the organization. But I think the, the takeaway here is that we're really trying to take a stab at refocusing our efforts in the wet utilities um, businesses in the city and you know, kind, of, kind of going through an assessment right now of what, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, where we have issues, uh, collaboration issues, integration issues, anything that we can identify that we can maybe work on to make us a stronger utility organization. Any of you have ideas? Yeah. And Roger, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board has. Well, um, so before in the Herald, are there three assistant city managers now? They being the, the replacement really to Dale, but it's a different organization than what Dale led. Some of the things that were in here are no longer in here. And where was Dave when Dale was the Herald? He was the electric utility director. The okay. Electric utility okay. Director. All right. What's not in here is natural resources, the sustainability program, the, um, the financial. So we, we had. Dale's group had kind of reproduced the whole financial group, and for good reason. The enterprise funds are, are a little different, certainly, than the general fund, but it was somewhat of an adjunct anyway to Jim Golden and Sandy Seaver's financial group, and so that formally moved over into, into that area just to fully integrate all the financial work together in the organization. And when was this affected? This or is. is this was about a month ago, and I mean, Harold's been working on these changes for about the last six months. About the time Dale retired. Well, with Dale leaving, you know, yeah. that's a big hole. Yeah, it did, and that, yeah. that was part of the thinking here was to you know, work with the strengths of those that we had in front of us. Okay. Any questions, Scott? Yeah. Uh, Tom, any questions mm -hmm. about this? No, I think that was a really good overview. Thank you. For okay. Thanks a lot. Are you pleased with your new job? These would be a word <laughs> <of> worse. <laughs> <laughs> you, know. you know, I love the challenge of, of working to, to optimize things in a professional so what it is and keep a really strong team. Congratulations, Mr. Murphy. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, Bob. So you made the short straw. <laughs> <laughs> All right, appreciate it. Um, Josh, I don't know who Josh is. <laughs> this is behind me, I guess. Josh, you're uh, running that project on a hill. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Jason had asked. Um, my name is Josh Sherman. I'm a civil engineer with Public Works. Um, currently managing the city's Pike Park tank replacement project, so up at Sunset Street in the golf course area. Um, doing some work there to replace our existing like, treated water storage and distribution facility at that location. 
I have a brief presentation if, if you're interested in, it's one that I've given before, so you might have seen it if you've been involved, uh, been in attendance at the public meeting where the city presented earlier this year on this project to the public. Um, but just one minute, Josh. You bet. I think it'd be helpful. You bet. So um, this, again, uh, Price Park Tank Replacement Project, and we can jump to the next, to the second slide when Heather gets it up and running. Um, I'll speak a little bit to the, to the project scope of work for the project, um, some history on this site in general as it relates to, to the water system, um, some of the project benefits. We have some project plans and renderings that we can uh, share with you all. I'll discuss a little bit about the project schedule and some of the temporary construction impacts around that site today, and then be happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, this graphic here on the uh, on this introductory slide is a, a <clears throat> landscape rendering of um, what the facility will look like um, when we're done. I actually have this same rendering later in the presentation, so I can go over it in more detail uh, in, in just a second. Um, so the, the improvements that are included with this project are a new 8 million gallon uh, circular pre-stressed concrete water storage tank, uh, a new 12 million gallon per day pump station, um, a new electrical building and an emergency generator for that facility, and then some adjacent site improvements, uh, some new fencing, some landscaping to buffer the new facility, <clears throat> and then some irrigation system improvements around that area. What's the existing capacity of the tank up there now? Sure. Uh, so the next slide shows the scope of work, which includes demolition of uh, the two reservoirs that are there, there today. There's an existing 7 million gallon reservoir that was in service, and then an existing 2 million gallon reservoir that was not in service. So both of those are being demolished. Um, there's a pump station actually at that site that has not been in operation for several years that's also being demolished, along with a few miscellaneous outbuildings and some limited tree removal. Um, the existing water tower, so the elevated storage tank, is not being impacted with this project. Um, and then additionally, there's some water line replacements um, around the facility, so in Sunset Street and Sunset Circle and then in, in Sunset Pool parking lot um, to help uh, replace some of the, the transmission lines and distribution lines that help feed water into and out of this particular site. <clears throat> A lot of people talk about that existing water tower. We just use it for antenna placement, basically. That's right. So it's it's no longer in service, and and as it relates to the, to the water system, it hasn't stored water for several years or decades. Um, but it is still part of uh, the city's infrastructure as it serves as a communications tower for emergency operations. And a landmark, you know. And and it's seen as a landmark by the community. Yeah, only a tiny way off. <laughs> you used it. <laughs> so the next slide is a, is a little bit of the history on this particular uh, site. Price Park was once known as Reservoir Hill. Uh, the first two million gallon reservoir was constructed in the late 1800s, um, and then subsequently in 1922, the uh, original seven million gallon reservoir was constructed. And then in the 1940s was when that uh, water tower. The elevated storage tank was constructed with a pump station as the city continued to grow from the original town to the north and to the west. There was some need there to provide some additional elevated storage for pressurized, pressurizing the distribution system in, the, in those new locations. And then in the 1950s, the original two million gallon reservoir was replaced. In the late 1960s, uh, roofs were installed over those reservoirs. So you can see in the picture in the bottom right is likely the two million gallon reservoir. Um, and, and again, these are reservoirs, so they're, they're storage below ground. And then for water quality purposes, roofs were installed to you know, keep out birds and other things. And so then, uh, let's see, in the 1990s, we, um, we took that two million gallon reservoir offline. Uh, also in the 1990s is when the water tower was no longer in service uh, and the pump station was decommissioned. And then in 2015 is when the uh, planning began for this project to start looking at replacement of these facilities. And then between now, and, uh, between then and now, to 2021 with design, 
and we, we've started construction this year. Oh, uh, Mr. Keith, you're yeah. adding, but the, um, the existing tank when it's finished, or the new tank, what will the coverage of that, will it be a structure over it, or? It's, it'll uh, be circular in shape, it's partially buried, and it'll have a domed roof over the top. So there, and there's some renderings that'll show that. Okay. So some of the uh, benefits to the distribution system that we'll be able to protect and improve water quality for the entire city, be able to enhance the ability uh, to meet current and future water demand, uh, provide critical water service during emergencies, and then significantly reduce the footprint of the facility, which I'll show in the site plan. Um, to, to speak in more detail, go ahead. I also wanted to add that the, the oh, go back sorry, there, please. tanks that are being replaced were at they were definitely at the end of their life cycle yes. and not likely to be able to continue passing the state's inspections for our storage tanks. So that was that was coming to an end. Mm -hmm. That's hence the water quality improvements. So. That is part of the water quality improvements. Um, and some of the ideas behind increasing from the seven million gallon to, a, to an eight million gallon storage facility is to provide some additional storage, not just um, for the area that this particular tank serves, but for storage for the entire city because uh, there's a new pump station that allows us to pump in some other higher pressure zones, um, which provides some redundancy for our distribution system and, and reduces some risk related to where some of our other storage is located and, and how we move water into the city as a whole. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, the, the other little footnote on this slide is that this project was included back in the uh, 2020 uh, water bond that was approved um, by 80% of the voters. So this is one of those two projects in, in addition to the uh, treatment plant expansion that were included with those, those costs. <clears throat> you know, you're, uh, there's a ton of new piping going on in there yes. all around. What now? Is that necessary to replace existing pipe and how to, what's that all about? We have about 100 years of uh, the city deciding how we're, <laughs> we've been operating our distribution system due to growth and other factors. And so um, part of it is <clears throat> trying to separate out some of that piping away from and around the facility today and as part of the first phase of construction so that we continue to, to move water into the city and, and through the city while then we can turn over sort of the rest of the site to the contractor for the next year to really focus on building the new reservoir and pump station mm -hmm. without having risk or impact into, in, into how we're moving water. And so that was part of that, that those water lines that I mentioned. Um, and yes, there's a significant number in the parking lot and, and, and around the facility. <clears throat> a lot of that was aging infrastructure too, so yeah. it had to be replaced. So next slide. <clears throat> this is just an engineer, engineering drawing of, of the site plan. It shows the circular tank there in the center in the dark gray. You can sort of see in the background the aerial image how that new facility fits within the footprint of the larger seven million gallon reservoir. And then off to the left or to the west of the tank is the new pump station and, and electrical facilities and um, other appurtenances that are needed for this site. And, um, but again, we're reducing the footprint today and, and around the perimeter of the site, you'll, you'll see that we're you know, sort of bringing that fence line in around this, uh, around this facility. And you'll see in the next slide with the landscaping plan, how that opens up a little bit of buffer to the north and some green space. And so council member, if that's your hand up for a question, yes. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you know what the power consumption and full operation of the pump station is? Oh, that's a great question. Not off the top of my head, I do not. <laughs> if you can oh. find that, I'd like to know. I'm thinking about counting up all of the um, discretionary power consumers we have in the city. Okay. It doesn't have to run all the time, right? That would be a pretty infrequent operation, wouldn't it, Josh, for the most part? So, um, not necessarily. So, that pumps. So, in a broader picture, the, the city's distribution setup is, is in three zones or pressure zones. And this tank um, serves our lower pressure zone, zone one. Mm -hmm. So the, the tank just feeds water down into zone one. This pump station is going to boost water back up into zone three. And the idea is that we would do that 
typically during peak demand season, so that would be during the summer and during the irrigation season, um, which means it would run more often than during the summer. And whether or not there's a need to run it in the winter um, is, is yet to be determined. There may be a need to run it in the winter, not necessarily because of the demand in zone three, but to maintain water quality in that tank and turn over that water because there's not a lot of demand down in zone one to do that on its own. And in the summer, does it run most of the time or does it run when something needs to be pushed? It'll run when there's a demand, so when something needs to be pushed. It, it won't run 24 right. yeah. seven. What's the capacity? 12 million gallons per year. Our Skyline tank currently operates that way, only in the summer and then pump cycle on exactly for that reason. But our system is, if I may add, is mm -hmm. predominantly a gravity flow system all the way from mm -hmm. the headwaters. If you get our waters from down into the city, in the peak in the past, we ran the Wade Gas Water Treatment Plant in the summer months and had to lift that water with pumps up to the north tank. So ever since we've stopped operating that facility, we've had significant reduction in power usage. And the addition of this pump station running the skyline still wouldn't equate to how much we had to once upon a time. It was 24-7 for the months that operated. Um, so, so again, this is just more of a detailed uh, rendering of the landscaping plan. A couple things I'll, I'll point out is there's a designated park, Christ Park, immediately to the east. Um, by removing the two million gallon reservoir and pulling back the fence line, it'll open up some, some open space there to the north of the tank. The area that sort of looks gray to me in this, in this picture is, is turf grass because of that park use. But the area that's light green around the tank facility is, is native seeding. Um, to try to reduce some of that mm -hmm. water consumption within the facility. And then, uh, we, like I mentioned before, we provided some, some landscape planting, trees and shrubs to buffer the new facility from, from the right of way, whether that's Long Peak, Long Peak Avenue, or from the residential use to the north, some of those subdivisions. Um, so to, to also know, there's a, there's a zeroscape garden sort of to the northwest. It's kind of like the little orange area up on, above the red X's that will be maintained um, up in that area. And then I mentioned before we needed to replace the irrigation system. There's actually four separate irrigation systems that once worked, you know, operated with Christ Park versus what was inside the fence versus the sort of the boulevard to Long Peak Avenue. And so we're combining all those into, into one system to make it a little bit easier for park operations to, to maintain this area. And then last but not least, there are some mature trees, specifically the red X's, we try to limit how many need to be removed, but they need to be removed in order to allow for um, construction of the new water lines and facilities. They're actually probably growing over and around the existing water lines and facilities today, but might be why they're so nice and healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> so this is a, a rendering of, of the new facility from uh, sort of looking northwest from Sunset Street at the intersection of Sixth Avenue. You can see the circular tank. There's some architectural relief with uh, brick tile afters and, um, and then a domed roof. The, the domed roof is a function of, um, it, it allows for not having pillars or columns on the inside of that reservoir, which can help uh, reduce the long-term maintenance costs um, in that facility. The next slide is another rendering sort of from the Sunset Circle neighborhood. Um, looking west, you see the elevated tank and then in the background, the new ground storage tank and, and how that dome roof, you know, elevation sort of fits with the, <clears throat> the existing roof lines of the neighborhood. Again, the, the tank is partially buried. So there's, there's water storage below ground, similar to what the reservoir did before. And then um, additionally, there's some storage above ground is new and will allow for some flexibility for the city to provide uh, a little bit better pressure down to that zone one, which currently today um, is teetering right on sort of our 50, 55 pounds uh, pressure down in that zone of, of our benchmark. So the new water level mm -hmm. is 
So it'll be higher than what you had before then? It'll be above existing grade and it'll be higher than what it was before. So the one you had before was the deductible grade. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. okay. Next slide. So the, the project schedule, I mentioned some of the planning that started in 2015 through, through uh, 2019, preliminary design. And final design, we're in 20 and 21. We uh, did this project out early this year and awarded a contract in the spring. Uh, the contractor did, didn't start work out on site until after Labor Day when the Sunset Pool closed. And we tried to allow some time between when we awarded the contract and starting construction for materials procurement, um, you know, given the current uh, industry today and <clears throat> uh, still been a challenge. But nonetheless, the, the construction duration is for 18 months, so that would put project completion in about March of 24. And, and they have started work out on site. I know you're aware. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, Very interesting. Next, next slide. Do you live in that area, Ron? Do you? I do. Do you live right? Yeah. Cool. Um, th these are some of the construction impacts. Again, we're following standard work hours within the city, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., limited work on weekends. Construction access is a challenge in this area. Um, <clears throat> we've actually allowed the contractor to close the westbound lane of Longs Peak Avenue for staging, and we've temporarily widened uh, the eastbound lane of, of Longs Peak Avenue for two-way traffic and, and included some uh, temporary pedestrian access down there as well. Um, I talked a little bit about the water line work, and there's always an impact to customers when we're um, connecting in new mains to old mains and, and temporary shutdowns in that way. And then um, the last thing I want to note is you know, the recreation facilities, so the golf course and the pool will remain open. And um, Sunset Park and Price Park will also mostly remain open, although Price Park is currently closed because they're constructing a, a water main right through the middle. But it'll be open as soon as we're done. Um, Next slide. This was just a, a, a brief um, visual of what I just described where the, the staging is that, that dark hatched area on the westbound of Longs Peak Avenue, so that upper section of that road if you've ever driven it. And then the lower section of the eastbound was temporarily widened to allow for two-way traffic. <clears throat> and then the next slide. Oh, that's all I had in there today. So there's some, some highlights of, of the work that's going on. Um, again, it's, we are under contract and the construction is underway. They've, they've actually demolished the seven million gallon reservoir, so that roof and, and all that work has been done. Um, they're doing a lot of water line work right now in and around the facility. Um, there'll be some continued demolition through the winter. Um, a lot of earthwork to, to, to bring in some fill in areas of that existing reservoir. And then uh, the new tank construction will happen through the spring and summer of next year. So you'll start to see that come up and out of the ground, um, along with some of the other ancillary items like the pump station, the electrical building, and things like that. Well, I know your construction people are being challenged by a lot of people walking dogs. I mean, it's a <laughs> very popular place for people. And they've been very nice about it. I mean- I'm glad to hear that. I get a little nervous walking behind some of that equipment, but people stay away. But it's, it's Contractor? Uh, Guardy Construction is the contractor. Any other questions? No. I did feel compelled to ask could you mention the time of the Yeah. Okay. It's on your website. Yes. Um, that, I think the last slide showed that we, we do have a website. Um, these slides are up on Engage Long Lawn as well. We have a project hotline, so if any of the of the public out there um, has any concerns or notices anything, they can call the hotline. That's on the there's some signage out there as well that has that number and then my contact information as well. Just to clarify, this is going to be natural seating. This is going to be 
Snodgrass? Yes. We're adding it up. Are we going to have the Snodgrass? We are adding the Snodgrass. Are we... Don't know that the lake is... Just for water consumption purposes? Is that a consideration? You know, we work with natural resources, and they do not have a master plan for Price Park and Sunset Park. So Price Park sort of the, is the designated area to the east. And then Sunset Park is that little facility out by the golf course clubhouse. Um, and they do not have a master plan yet, you know, for, for ultimately those, those two facilities. And we've talked with them about that, you know, long term, how does this new area integrate in with that? Um, as an engineer, my speaking point is that's water department property. And although we also don't have a master plan, that might tell us what we need to use that for. We may need it sometime in the future for water purposes, and if we call it a park, we may not ever get that use back for water for water facilities. Um, so we've had some of those high-level conversations, but um, we didn't. We, we opened it up for that use, I guess I should say, as, as a more it will become a more open area for the public use. Uh, one of the ideas is to provide sort of a cross connection, if you will, between sunset and the pool. Because right now the only pedestrian access is really um, one sidewalk along Long's Peak Avenue. And if you've ever walked it in the previous condition, it was really what half the people do is they just walk in Long's Peak because traffic volume is relatively low, but it's really a four or five foot wide sidewalk that has bicycles and people walking their dogs and all kinds of things. So there was some thought about you know that that area being available for better cross connectivity between Sunset Street and, and the pool, um, but that doesn't necessarily answer your question about you know should it be sawed or should it be um, native. We did you know have that larger discussion, which is why we went with native on the interior. But. I would say also a couple things. I think there usually was an attempt to kind of match it with the surrounding area of golf course, the same type of turf. But I, I've heard before too that you have to be a little careful of those natural grasses near a golf course because that seed migrates into that and then creates that wrong growth into it as well. I don't know if that was a concern here. This is east, basically downwind of the golf course, so it would, yeah. that shouldn't be a big problem. But in some areas, of course, buffer strips um, can cause those types. Sort of two other factors, and I don't know that it shows up very well on that particular slide, but that area north of the new tank will be sloped because the existing tank sort of set up a little bit on the hill compared to where the park elevation is. So it is a bit of a slope, and then again, that there is some anticipated heavier use in that area, which might indicate the need for sod versus a, a native grass. Okay, um, just uh, we all Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. It is sawed inside the fence today, so the footprint's obviously different, obviously different with two reservoirs and the limited amount of sod that is in there, but it is sawed inside the fence today and that has been changed. So I, it'd be interesting to do the net calculation on how much additional sod can be added, if any. What's the, what's the timeline in terms of the turf restoration then? Yeah. Right, so the impacts to um, the two parks, um, <laughs> uh, they'll they will re restore those so that they're get, to, to get them back hooked up and sorted. So this is that water line that's been constructing now, which is why it's sort of this whole area is closed. But I've asked them to repair this and repair the work up at Sunset, so that um, so that this spring and summer those two areas are open back up. So there's not a lot of time to walk over the fence or pluck those in. Oh oh well no there is up here. Because today this is where the two million gallon reservoir sits and the yeah. contractor has been allowed to have the use inside the fence so the fence line is sort of here today so they're going to need all of this area for construction so even once they demolish out the, the two million gallon reservoir they're going to be the way they construct these circular tanks there's going to be concrete casting beds on site and, and things in that area before this gets relined here 
Uh, so it's going to be a focus. lasty waste for a while. It is, it is. The focus is just to reopen up the park to use as soon as possible. Ah. But not inside the facility. So we could go native in that. There is, some, there is still some time to make that decision, yes. Josh, what would that what would that do to the project, the project planning? Would you probably want to, if, we were, if that was going to be changed, mm -hmm. a recommendation, you'd want to know that by, what, a year from now, six months from now, yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> the sooner the better always in construction, yeah. um, but we do have some time. I think if we knew even by, you know, spring of this coming year, we get that change implemented easy enough that you know it impacts things like the irrigation design yeah, and, and some exactly. of that stuff but would would that and natural resources I assume would kind of want to weigh in on how that was changed they were if it, they were involved with that original decision I think it's pretty to include yeah. them again. So if there's a recommendation here the sooner the better and then we could vet that with the natural resources. What would be the area approximately I mean the area like acres yeah, the, the one, so I heard somebody say one and a quarter or one and a half acres is probably not a bad estimate. It's probably at least an acre because the entire, that landscape rendering sort of, if you, if you took out Longspeak Avenue, that whole area is about five and a half acres. So again, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but. That's why you were asking about lot size, isn't it? Because you were trying to get <laughs> <laughs> You were puzzling how many could fit in there. <laughs> Yeah, because that acre and a half looks like it'd be pretty credible guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions from Josh? I do have one. Um, All right, so I'll just reload, just relay this back to Bob. So it was mentioned that the, uh, that the existing tanks uh, we're going to kind of start ceasing to kind of meet regulatory requirements with respect to kind of water quality. Um, just out of my own kind of curiosity and interest, what are the types of things that start to show up in like those water quality tests or what, what types of parameters are the ones that start to kind of come out of spec with older tanks? So in, in this case, deteriorating concrete is always an issue. Um, in this case, this tank had a liner in the bottom, and that liner was a, a membrane that has to be maintained with zero penetrations through it, and that's really hard to do, and we were at the end of its life, so just to replace that in, in that tank was not possible in the type of membrane we were using, so it was going to take a lot of change to the floor and then some kind of surface you know, closure or membrane on top of that and now you're getting into the cost of building a new tank for those types of items. It was it had doors that it shouldn't have. Humans could enter the tank, which is never a good thing um, from the surface ground level. So those penetrations also were notorious areas for leaks or air to get through or critters to get through. So a lot of just deterioration on the whole structure, but in particular, the liner was a, a problem and was not going to be able to be replaced cheaply. Okay. I know one of them, the, it has masonry walls that are the vertical walls yeah. that, that support the roof. And so it's, it's more of a risk to water, water quality than it was impacting water quality yet, but you, there were gaps in some of that masonry that was gonna need to be repaired, right? And go around all the, the vertical walls and, and deal with grouting and things like that, that would have been, to yeah, a certain then, extent, for new yeah. new walls. <laughs> the, and the last piece of it is that tank had a lot of dead spots in it, so you'd have stagnant water in areas, just from the way it was designed. And so eliminating things like that are pretty important to us over time. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I just got uh, two quick updates for you. So I received 100% plans for the, uh, the DTR-112. That is our um, uh, North St. Crane pipeline replacement project. 
And so that's that, uh, I think it's about 1917 to 1800 linear feet, somewhere around there, um, of pipeline that uh, needs to be replaced as part of that CIP. And that's everything that's basically within the CDOT right away within Highway 66, just east of Waters. And so I know the, the title of that CIP is replacing it, but we're not actually, we're not actually going to replace the pipe. We're going to run a CIP through line through it. So long story short, we've got 100% plans for that. We're going to be um, starting in January of next year. We're going to start going up bid for that. Um, uh, those funds are, um, with the project's fully funded, um, we've even uh, had some additional funding given the elevated costs from uh, recent market conditions and stuff like that. So we feel confident we should be able to go out there and, and do that. And the liner that we'll be putting in that, um, we're gonna make that a, um, an NSF approved liner. So it'll meet the drinking uh, drinking water standards even when it's on a raw water liner here. So there's some so some additional funding in there for, for that. And then the, um, the other project we have going on, um, it's, um, not directly related to, to water resources, but kind of is. We've got the, uh, the Union Reservoir Inlet Bridge project that we're doing. And so the initial plan was, I don't know if you've been out there recently, but it's, you know, we've got the culverts in the inlet channel. And that's really just, it's it's falling apart. It's not very safe. You know, we've got some water quality issues with that. And um, it just, it's one of those things where sooner or later that it's, it's gonna fail or somebody's gonna get hurt. So we're, we're gonna install a bridge and that bridge actually We'll be able to incorporate that bridge if we get some funding and move forward with the uh, reservoir enlargement project. So we'll be able to pick that bridge up, uh, and, you know, raise the abutments up and reset it down. So um, that's when that that construction starts in January, and it's lot it's expected to last about uh, a month to two months. And the bridge will be ready um, in April. And so once the bridge is on location, we'll literally take the train, set it down. Is there a, a date for reservoir enlargement, or is that something still being discussed? Or? It's something that's being discussed. Um, we have it in our CIP as, as an unfunded project, but it's something that we, you know, every six years we do a diligence case on. And there is some NRCS funding that uh, uh, the St. Brain Electric Water Conservancy District um, has put in for, up to potentially, I think, like 25 million. So, you know, should we be awarded that, or be, should there be the potential of us being awarded that? Um, what might be a 20-year project might end up being a five-year project. So, um, I have no idea what the odds of us getting that grant funding is, um, but you know, it's it's probably in the top five. interest in um, our landscape standards um, as per the conversations we've been having for the last year probably um, um, especially for the public uh, right ways and arterials um, there we talked a little bit about um, the the public arterial spaces that are maintained by private organizations such as HOAs or um, businesses and then the city pays for that water um, and so that was brought up. So that's definitely something that we want to make sure that we're studying in our efficiency master plan update, um, just kind of ways to approach that moving forward. Um, we talked about population and not to use a specific number in our population um, projection. And so um, potentially looking at, at scenario planning, um, the, the Colorado State Water Plan uses Plan as well, so we would, I think we would be encouraged to pursue that. Um, obviously, we would have to work with the planning department and those types of other people, but uh, I think that's what's important about where we want to go is collaborative and cross departmental collaboration on all of our goals, um, and especially our water goals. Um, so, yeah, it was really well received, so excited about it. 
Um, and then they also asked the question, which has come up at Water Board as well, um, about efficiency versus con conservation and what are we using for the definitions. Um, and so I did some digging and the Colorado Water Conservation Board, which is the entity that requires us to do these efficiency master plans, um, put out a definition for us. And um, for the purposes of this plan, conservation measures and programs are replaced with water efficiency activities. So we're using efficiency to encompass conservation for the purposes of these plans. I don't know that we'll do that programmatically or internally within the city of Longmont, but I think for our efficiency master plan purpose, that's what we will use. So um, we will use them basically interchangeably for the purpose of our plan activity. So it still will be a circular. Yeah. You can't say efficiency without saying efficiency in the, in the definition. Yes. Um, do our uh, communicating water meters have any protection for humidity? Yeah, yeah there's no water system kind of protection. We don't use it, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's part of, and I'll let you speak to this too, Bob, but um, yep, our, our new water meters do, but we don't have to program them. I mean, so that's one of the big projects I'm working on actually is figuring out how to do it manually until we can get um, basically the software to be communicating from those meters to the plumber. Sure. Yeah. Is the replacement program driven by remote reading? Is that what's driving it? And, and those, the ability to do detect other information from the meters. We have not really advertised to our customers that we're using the meters to retrieve other data other than polarization data. But we do, we do look to see if there's a backflow in the meter, which would uh, be really critical information and, and leak detection. But it's a little hit or miss right now. It's mostly based on investigation where we either hear a problem or we think there's a problem and we go back and look at the data. But yeah, eventually we should be able to have all meters reporting into a central database anytime they see 24 7 flow through the meter, right? There would be some indication that you probably have a leak or an appliance that's using it in order to make sure. And then, then the reverse flow, those would be the two critical pieces of information besides the billing outreach. Questions for everyone? Nice work, John. Thank you. Told you I keep it under time. So. <laughs> Nobody's blaming you, won't you? That you all are interested. It's great. It's good. Okay, what do you have, Sam? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to cheat a little bit today and actually just show you the presentation that um, Northern staff gave us today. We could guess what his, his committee was. It was really, it was a really good one this year. So um, it's a good one. So let me go ahead and. Uh, So um, just a quick update on the So I'll start with this photo just because I really think this is a cool photo. This is actually in the middle of the night. Um, they're, they're fully operating 24 hours a day up there now. So yeah, you know, so much work to do to get everything going. But you can really see the site Lit up at night, and of course, you can see Long Mountain, North Denver on the right, and Love Burton, and um, probably Cold River on, on the left side of that photo. So, kind of a, kind of a neat perspective of the project. Um, the most uh, important part, of course, is where we leave the dam. You can see on this photo on the right, um, this is where the, the core of the dam had been over excavated uh, 40. 50 feet below existing ground to get down to competent rock and, and get um, the plant started and everything going. Um, if you look, this is looking towards the east at the right abutment. This is the steep side of the reservoir site. Um, this is 
very steep as you get up here. This part of the plant is completely done now, and they've switched over and they're working on the west side of it, um, which is still a, a lot of work to do up there and still fairly steep, but, but this was the really critical part. So good to see that. If you look here at the bottom, um, 42 feet of the dam has already been constructed, so that's not insignificant. Um, this on the left is a photo of the actual machine, the lay down. Um, this, this particular machine lays both the hydraulic asphalt core, which you're seeing here in the middle, as well as the, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of a sandy rock mix on each side that buttresses or kind of contains that hydraulic asphalt core. And then on the right side of that, or each side of that, you can see the, the rock fill. And here you can see the rock fill out here as well as out here. So um, 42 feet is a really great start, and that's uh, um, going well. Uh, this is the actual rock fill process. Um, we have these 777 trucks, or six of them fully in use 24 hours a day. We got another straight coming, so. 13 plans for the whole project. So that's that's one of the largest you know trucks you can get. So that's that's a lot of work. A lot of material being moved. Um, this is the looking at the very very west side. Looking down, this is the west, the bottom end, of, not the bottom. End, the, this is the part of the plant that still needs to be constructed, but for the most part, it's it's uh, nearly done. Um, once. Once the plant is down, then they start drilling through the plant um, to grout. So about 40% of the grout um, curtain has been constructed. They're doing it at the bottom and they're going up off the, to the sides to stay ahead of the construction. So the grouting's going well. Um, and then as far as the, uh, the water deliveries, the, the conduit will come out of Carter CBT pipeline um, up on the top of Pole Hill west of the project and go on down um, to the control house. But um, the, the tie in to the CBT system is all done, including the valve that has to shut off the water so it doesn't come out of the CBT system. That had to be really carefully controlled time wise with um, the Bureau of Reclamation to have shut down the main, shut down the CBT system maintenance on the CBT system and they had to get done before they were done <laughs> and, and that did happen so that, that's good. Um, this is um, one of the, I believe that's the control valve, the upper valve valves. Um, the inlet and outlet tunnel actually looks like a tunnel now. You probably saw the pictures earlier on when they were going in the header and just starting it. Um, you know this, this was a fully built tall wall there. So that you can really go ahead and see that tunnel. Um, and the end of November is 27% complete. They're now they're now getting close to the, to the valve chain in the middle. So they're they're starting to just now starting to come in from the upstate side. So they'll bring those two tunnels together. Um, uh, this is just where the interconnect was on Bald Mountain. Uh, this was but what is interesting enough, this is, if you've ever been up to Pinewood um, Reservoir, this would be called Rattlesnake Reservoir, um, this is where the water comes out of the reservoir into the Pole Hill Tunnel through Pole Hill before it gets to the, to the power conduit above um, Flat Iron Reservoir. And this is, they had shut, they had drained the reservoir down so they could shut this down. Have one small leak in the actual CBT side of the system, um, but, but uh, eventually it'll need to be repaired. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a major part of this. Um, and uh, this is at the base of the dam. If you're standing on the dam looking north, down on the downstream side, if you look to the left, you go up to where up the hill to where you connect to the uh, CBT pipeline. If you go to the right, um, this is where the pipeline will connect to the 
conduit that goes from the flat iron reservoir to the power plant up to Carter Lake. So this is, if you look here, there, there's a pipe that goes up here. Carter Lake's on the other side of this ridge. The pipe goes up a hill and into the bottom of Carter Lake. The water actually comes up the bottom of Carter Lake and it fills Carter Lake. This will be interconnected so that if there's ever a problem with the flat iron power plant, um, and it has to be shut off. We did have that. There's three units in there. One of the three is a reversible turbine that can pump up or take, um, blow the water down and generate electricity. That um, blew up about 10 years ago. So we were out of water. Couldn't get water in Carter. Luckily, Carter had plenty of water in it, or we wouldn't have been happy. <laughs> but um, that was recognized as a weak spot on the entire CDP system. So this will allow water come out of uh, Timmy Hollow and go and go out by gravity to, to Carter. And if Carter's down, then Timmy Hollow will follow. So it's, it's a, just a redundancy to see that. That that's is started. And then it was uh, excavated on the downstream side of the uh, dam for the valve house. So this, this is where all the water will be controlled coming down from the west. You can see the, the penstock for the and, and the flat iron power here, um, way up here at the top of the hill. So this pipe will come out, come down here, and then the water can either go from here into that um, the, the, uh, connecting pipeline we just saw and go to Carter Lake, or it'll go from here into the pipeline through the inlet outlet tunnel and into the uh, Timmy Hall Lake. So this was the main workhorse for the project. Um, just, you know, just starting the excavation, just getting going. as well. Um, one of the one, well, I guess I'll call it a completed <laughs> item is that this is a picture of the road that will go around the west side of the reservoir. It starts up on the county road that will go around above high water line from the west side of the reservoir through to the south side of the reservoir. This will be the road for the general you know, maintenance on the reservoir as well as uh, the saddle dam on the south side but it also will provide access to the Larimer County um, Recreational Facility, so we're constructed as part of the uh, uh, reservoir. Um, just some of the key milestones, the first hydraulic asphalt started October 15th, the access road was completed November 16th, um, and the last uh, hill placement <laughs> um, and then hopefully have the Carter Lake uh, interconnect done uh, next spring. So this is, this is here pretty, pretty soon. Um, one thing I did want to show here is this is the, in an ideal world, the blue line was the expected expenditure line. So here, one way of, one way is monitor the construction, and the other is monitor the, the expense expenditures. Uh, this is what it got us done. This is what was expected. This red line is where we are actually are right now, which is pretty good. And then the orange line is um, kind of the, the lowest, um, the slowest expenditure, um, which both, both lines end up getting done at about the same time. So as long as we're in between those two. But um, original contract amount, uh, 485 million. Uh, to date, the change orders are 26 million. We're, the current construction contract is 511 million. Um, and the earned to date is 127 million. So about 25% of expenditure at this point um, done, which is on, basically on target um, and doing well. Uh, the, 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 Twenty-six million change orders. That, that's all the ones we talked about. You know, the rock, the uh, additional rock. It's it's going in heavier and, and, and tighter, which means you got better rock fill down, but it's going to be a little more rock. You know, um, there was a uh, little bit of extra excavation on there uh, uh, to get down to competent bedrock. Uh, just a number of different things over the course of the run. 
all of those changes are well within the, the contingency amount that has already that was budgeted and is already up to more than water, um, which kind of leads back to our cash needs question we were talking about. Um, right now, um, they've also looked at future potential change orders or anything you would you know to see, and we're good. We have sufficient funds, although it's pretty close. We, we're projecting um, that we may fully utilize the um, contingency funds, uh, but they aren't as right now aren't particularly more. One thing that, that is, I'll call it traditional, um, was the cost um, due to the federal lawsuit. So that's two point, about two point four million dollars, was a cost for delay for the construction due to the federal lawsuit. Um, that that's the contractor cost, um, not the settlement cost. That amount so far, that amount was kind of, I'll call it paid out, was included in the contingency, but because of the contingency fund probably won't, won't cover that. Um, Northern Water is looking at um, asking the participants, you know, to base kind of separately, so to speak, for that um, change order amount for the um, federal lawsuit. So they're looking around to 2.4, my guess they're probably gonna be 2.4 million, which was an actual change order that was approved uh, at the time of settlement of the federal lawsuit. If that happens, that will be on top of what has already been funded. Um, in you know, around three or four hundred thousand, maybe seven seven point five up, up over ninety would be our portion. That's the entire contract for that two point four million. So um, we'll probably be asked for that. Um, we've asked, hey, let us know before our budget. <laughs> Um, but we will actually probably will collect the money till 24, 24 and 12. Uh, but we've asked them to give us, you know, if we're going to collect it, um, let us know so that we can put it in our 23 budget. So that then, I guess, really we'll have the conversations. Hopefully, we'll probably, um, hope we'll have them by the March cash money because I need it to put it in the budget <laughs> for 24 uh, by March. If that's the case, then we can have that conversation through the one. And then, of course, we got to turn this more onto the policy decision of the board to be in charge of developer for a federal lawsuit. <laughs> Is that, you know, do we extract that to the cost of the project? Probably so, I think so, but, you know, that's, that's a conversation we can have in March. Once we get that number, then we might have that um, as an effect. So that's, that, because that's a little bit of a different on where that uh, request. Um, certainly hope that the remainder of the project and the, and the expected uh, change orders you know, won't get us over what the original project um, bin cost, the contingency cost, but um, that's kind of where we are right now with, with the budget. Um, oops. Uh, and this is just a copy of the actual Executed change orders because they're both already um, already uh, done and future. And then uh, this is just a, a second because I like these that I don't know why. Gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. impressive. They're just really easy to impress. The first one showed Dale flying to Cancun and that airplane. <laughs> that airplane I saw, yeah. <laughs> Did it come back? No, I'd say, and this one does not show me coming back, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Questions for Ken? Yeah. Yeah. Those costs, I assume, spread to the participants based on what you said, which is what they signed yeah. up for. So yeah. they spread that over. So. And it's really, I mean, we bought that result from our money we bought with time for that thing. So, yeah. in order to just pay for it and allocate it as we spend it. All right, very good. You know, one thing I always ask uh, if somebody, no public, wanted to get a, a view of the land site, is there a public up on the hill? Can they? You know, your point. 
pointing that out that way up on top, there's some kind of access. Is that true or not? Or uh, that there is. The property or what? Yeah, so there is a what they call Chimney Hollow Overlook. It, it, one of the properties up on, on the east side, basically on the hill between Carter and Chimney Hollow, there's a property that came all the way down the side and it came, it didn't, it came up for sale. So it was purchased by the project because it actually went down into the river so it had to be brought in there. That is, has been turned into an overlook. Um, it actually used to, they, were, they had a few tours last um, fall, but the road was in such bad shape that they shut it all down and they're rebuilding the road. And then one, once it's done next spring, they're going to reopen the tours so the public can get a tour, go up and, and overlook that. You can see some of this um, actually just going up the county road. Um, just drive up the county road from Flat and River Wharf. Park on the side of the road and take a look. You can yeah. see it from the distance. But the overlook on the east side is the best place yeah. to see. There are no in valley tours anywhere. It's just because of the construction and okay. one of those trucks was they squashed. As a demonstration, they squashed the pickup. <laughs> Flat All right, so sometime in spring they'll be reopening there. They'll be reopening and, and people will be up there. But, you know, I still encourage everybody to look at the website, show me all over the record, because um, you can see all the pictures. But you will actually be able to go out and, and sign up for tours to get to see it. Very good. Thanks a lot, Tim. All right, moving on. Uh, items from the board, any major projects? about that is that basically unchanged yeah and, uh, we'll just be coming probably in january with some water legislation if that's what we're okay okay yeah. any item 11 informational items anything on that item okay. and the items you can see on our kind of been scheduled for future board meetings so all right any other comments Everybody has to have a holiday. Right there, so. Thank you. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Okay, Don. Hi, Don.